from the great halls of their house, there are assembled three who hope to one day be the world's greatest driving heroes. Created from the cosmic legends of the universe comes our team captain, the Vision, Bill Fisher. Their soon-to-be Wonder Woman, Vicki Fisher. Our Captain Marvel and head flight trainee, Jennifer Scripchuk. And our Batman, the master of tools, gadgets, and all things mechanical, our mild-mannered soon-to-be billionaire, Alan Danvers. Their mission, to fight injustice, share what is right and wrong, to get you out of your house and come out racing with them, and serve all mankind. They are the Garage Heroes in Training Team. Welcome to the Garage Heroes in Training Podcast. I'm going to be your host for this episode. My name is Bill. Who else is hosting? I'm Vicky. You are. I figured I'd go with the traditional one because you always get mad at me when I change it, but that's fine. That's it's, fine. It's it, fine. It's all great. Fine. Miss Vicky. Yes. We have a guest. We do. We do. I first saw him or heard him. I'm not quite sure whether which way it was. Depends on where I jumped into the live stream. He uh he seems to be the official voice of Grid Life. He's also on the super secret stealth grid life team involved with rules and topics and all kinds of fun stuff. So we're going to bother him. And uh, he is involved with several other racing series, which we hope to get on. And, uh, you know, just in case you thought he had an off season, he also does sim racing. <sighs> I have no idea how he does all this stuff. I have no idea how he can talk anymore. I have no idea why he's going to talk to us, but Hey, I say that about everybody. Welcome to the podcast, Carl Heyer. Kyle Heyer, sorry. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. I hate when I read ahead and start mispronouncing things. But anyway, you got me very jealous with your uh, your video games in the background there, sir. We've already talked about yeah. it. but <laughs> Yeah, it's a cool office. This is the my part of the Grid Life office, which is actually moving in the building to uh, the Car Club in Chicago, which is one of uh, co-founder Chris's new ventures. So we're actually moving everything here in a couple of weeks. I, I I envy you a little bit, but I also know what the traffic in Chicago is like, so I'm not so envious, but uh, we're definitely going to have to take a visit next time I go through there, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. Yeah, it's, it, it's Chicago. I'm kind of way up in the northwest corner is where the grid life offices are, so I live actually about five minutes down the street, so it's pretty easy for me. Oh, is, good for you. That was a consideration when I was moving, for sure. We, uh, I, I experienced uh, Chicago traffic many times because I was working in Milwaukee and commuting home every other weekend to Connecticut. And uh, my only concern was how do I get around Chicago best? And uh, several times I, I chose poorly, but yeah, it happens. <laughs> it's yeah, okay. There's, there's a lot of times when you just can't choose right any time yeah. of the day. So yeah, <laughs> I get uh, it for sure. Exactly. It's like, it's like loops, right? It's like, this is the, I'm close to rush hour loop. This is the rush hour loop. And then there's the further loop. And then there's the, I just gave up and I'm going through Utah. It'll work. It's fine. So, sir, uh, you have a much better way of announcing and commentating than I do. And one of the things that I am the worst at is introductions. So, uh, since I do them so poorly, I always give the guest a chance to correct me or add to it. So uh, for people not familiar with you, Kyle, how would you uh, introduce yourself? Uh, I'd say I'm, uh, I'm the Grid Life Motorsports presenter uh, is my primary role. It's my full-time job. I was born and raised in Rochester, New York, and uh, moved here after college to, to work for Grid Life. And I think across the board, uh, I'm always watching motorsports from every from Formula One to club racing all the time. If there's a race on TV or on the internet, I'm watching it. And that's kind of been my life for the last uh, five or six years. Uh, and, and more recently in person uh, all the time. So travel a lot, um, and, but really enjoy it. And it's it's kind of turned into something a lot more than I expected when I started this whole thing. Yeah, your travel schedule in, increased quite a bit in 2022. I went from like kind of a regional to like not quite fully national, but not very far away. So I can just imagine. Yeah. It, again, I, I didn't fly on an airplane once until I was 19 or 20 years old. Um, so, I so never last flown. week, last week, <laughs> I'm 24 yeah. now, so it hasn't really been that long, okay. but it, it's uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, I had never flown and my first flight ever was to a grid life event. It was grid life South in 2019. I guess I would have been 
21 rather. But uh, since then, uh, I've traveled a lot for several different racing organizations and kind of gotten used to it and actually gotten over it <laughs> in some instances. But uh, <laughs> yeah. there's, you know, I, racetracks are great. Anytime I'm not going to a racetrack, it's not as fun of a trip. So your so your first flight was into Atlanta. Yes. Uh, no, Imagine that's, that. That's that's not the way to start, sir. No, that's, it was not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you manage to get involved in all this? So the story starts kind of in college. I was actually in school at Binghamton University in New York for electrical engineering, and I was not having a good time. Really didn't enjoy what I was doing. And my roommate in college uh, was an iRacer. And for those that aren't familiar, iRacing is a, a, an online racing simulator, basically. And he and I uh, kind of bonded over iRacing because I was a fan as well. And we started an iRacing broadcasting company called Sim TV, which essentially we were announcing and broadcasting people's league races. So people would get together on a Tuesday night and race and we'd announce it and upload it to our YouTube channel. And that kind of quickly started spiraling because we didn't stink at it. So we kept getting better and better over time and working with different people and kind of word of mouth. And uh, one of the leagues we were doing was the DC region SCCA's virtual racing league. And in that league was a guy you might've heard of DJ Alessandrini. Uh, who, former podcast guest. Yeah. So he, at the same time that he was racing in this league and we were broadcasting this league, he was also just getting his, free race car GLTC car. And so he was racing with, at the time it was called Track Midwest, which was uh, the kind of unofficial iRacing league. And he thought it'd be really cool to bring us on as SimTV to announce and broadcast those races. And we did, and then it kind of started moving, you know, more and more, we did a whole season that was winter of 2018. And then in the spring, I think it was April, I got a a private message on Facebook from Adam, Eric Cattill, Rob Wilkinson, a promo DJ and a few other people that asked wow. if I'd like to come out to Midwest and announce for real. So that's how it all started. Wow. Mm. That's that was pretty cool. That's, that's not, not a bad group. No, it's not. That, that, that's kind of my OG group that the guys that brought me in and they're still my, my buddies and Tom O'Gorman was there as well. This is when he was racing uh, in IMSA. And when I rolled up to the gate uh, at Midwest, uh, Bill Griffin mm-hmm. recognized my voice which wow. was super cool. I had never awesome. experienced that. And I met Tom. And at the time, I didn't know who Tom was uh, other than I knew he was an IMSA driver. And I was really intimidated by him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but five minutes in, it was it was awesome. So yeah. 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 You know what? That group has one other thing in common that, that you may not know about. They have not beaten us in any race ever because really? because we have not raced in any race with them <laughs> there you go 100 percent ratio exactly So, how do you like this new role yeah I, I so i'd say my biggest passion in motorsports is the broadcast side of it right um you know there's there's a lot of people that all they want to do is drive all they want to do is race or they want to make rules for a racing series or they, they want to host racing for me, it was the production and the presentation of it was super important to me. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure why, but I just watched so much of it that I kind of picked up on what was good and what was bad and, and what I would want my perfect racing broadcast to look like. So when I got hired, it was actually um, for uh, our, the gaming side of Grid Life. It was to kind of host all of our gaming initiatives and kind of run our, ra- our gaming department. But it also kind of ended up being... Um, turning into the, the, the broadcast side. So now I kind of operate, uh, at least from a, a planning perspective, everything that goes on uh, for the Grid Life broadcast. And this year it included the, the, the graphics. Um, so I, I really, really love having that high of a touch point on something so visual. And it was really satisfying this year to have the designs that I created end up on the broadcast. Wow. So, so we often talk about, uh, you know, we talk to a lot of people who actually race as their primarily reason for coming on. And, and we always have like their, their bucket list. Like I always want to go race at this track or I want to go. So from a racing perspective and from an announcing perspective, is there any racing that you'd like to, or races that you'd like to, or tracks that you'd like to announce or which ones are fun, I guess would be a cool way to. Yeah. I think, well, I mean, from a, from a racing perspective, um, I'll start with the announcing perspective. That's probably easier. From uh, I've gotten the chance to 
already hit one of those bucket list items and that was announced at my home track, which is Watkins Glen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to do some PA there last year with SRO and some pit reporting, which was really, really cool. Uh, but so that was one of the things. The other thing I'd love, I'd love to go international and do some 24 hour endurance race like uh, Le Mans or Spa. Spa is a big one, especially mm-hmm. in the SRO world. Uh, sure. So that that's certainly on the bucket list. And in terms of racing and actually driving, I, I do like driving. I, I, I enjoy cars a lot. Um, and I think I'd love to drive at the Glen. I'd uh, love to drive at uh, Road Atlanta. That's another place that I think mm-hmm. would be really, really cool. So those are a couple bucket list things. There's a, there's a long list and I've checked off more than I thought I would at 24 years old. Oh, you're, you're, you're way ahead of us. I don't think, I think I started the year coincidentally i think i was 50 when we started so you're you're not even halfway to where i started so you're way ahead of me so life is good Lee, certainly not bad no no you're doing you're doing something right or i was doing something wrong but whatever it doesn't matter so where go ahead no go ahead oh uh, where do you see all this going i mean you seem to pick like a pretty good gig here and uh do you see a trajectory first of all before you answer that question <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. (laughs) Is that this is really like taken off. I mean, you're on like a YouTube um, and but but it's not YouTube quality. It's, it's really good. But, but I'm just saying is that you're you're almost like there's a channel that you guys are on now too. Right. Um, I, well, so this, this year, so we, we stream our broadcasts on, on uh, Twitch, YouTube and Facebook for on the grid life side. And mm-hmm. on the SRO side, I have gotten the chance once to announce uh, on TV on CBS Sports, um, which was last year, and it was during the Grid Life Mid Ohio weekend. I got a call from my boss on the SRO side that said, "Hey, Calvin Fish, who's one of my favorite announcers of all time, he has to go to an IMSA race and announce at Road America. Are you available?" And I said, "No, but let me make a phone call." <laughs> so I, <laughs> but so I, I can be. <laughs> I can be. So I called Chris and I said, "Hey, man, this is this is a, an unreal opportunity. Would you let me go?" And he said, "Absolutely. Just." Uh, you know, solve the problem of you not being there to announce our stuff and go ahead. Okay. So I uh, called one of my SRO contacts, which is Greg Kramer, who ends up announcing for us a lot more down the road, but I, mm-hmm. I called him to fill in for me. And then I went to Nashville and announced on CBS with Ryan Marine. And then uh, that, that was an incredible experience. 100 to 10, 120,000 people at the event. I had people texting me that they were at an airport and saw me on TV. It was, it was so yep. cool. So uh, where, where do I see it going though? Uh, who knows? I didn't know. I did not ever plan on being a racing announcer. This whole thing is completely accidental. Again, I went to college for engineering and don't want to do that and don't ever see myself being able to fall back on that at this stage. So I'm, I'm committed to whatever this, this ends up as. Uh, I think long-term goal if i'm announcing on tv somewhere i think that'd be that'd be red it might be mm-hmm. grid life the way things are going who knows yeah so yeah. so it's kind of like i'm having trouble figuring out how to phrase the question so i'm just going to say it what does kyle's internal voice say when he's on a broadcast next to greg the first time I think there was this realization that what we're doing is, is real. And I didn't actually get a chance to announce with him until Road America in 2021 because uh, he was filling in for me. So I didn't get to sit next to him until later that year. And we were also on the trackside PA there. And there was yep. a moment when I did an intro for the last race of the weekend uh, for Grid Life Touring Cup where I could hear my voice echoing off of the hills at Road America. And then I stopped talking and Greg started talking and I heard his voice. And he was saying my name and I was saying his name. And I go, this is, this is real. What, what we're doing is this is real racing broadcasting. And I'm sitting next to a guy that is a legend at, at this. And that was really, really special. Mm-hmm. It is. Mm-hmm. So do you have a philosophy maybe when you're behind the wheel or in this whole racing environment that you kind of go by your own personal motto? From a driving perspective or from an announcing perspective? How I about both? Okay. Why does it have to be or when it can be sure. an and? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I think for me racing, I'm not a, an incredibly competitive person generally. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily, if, if I was, I would probably be in the car uh, if I'm being honest. Um, but I'm, I'm not as competitive as I am probably analytical. 
I really like the details of, of watching racing. I like understanding why someone's going faster. I like watching people that other people aren't watching uh, because mm-hmm. I know that there's something going on there that I should be paying attention to because they might be the guy that I need to watch in, in a minute. So there's, a, and from an analytical perspective, I think I, I kind of look at it like um, it, it's like a chess match more than it is a, a competition. And not, not that chess isn't competition, but it, there's more strategy, I think, playing around in my head than probably meets the eye. And I'm thinking about a lot more than I'm saying most of the time which is, is kind of a, a key, I think, because you can get yourself in trouble by only, only saying what you're thinking. You need mm-hmm. to be thinking more <laughs> because a lot of times what, what I've noticed myself doing in early stages is just in announcing, you have to talk all the time. You can't leave dead air. That's, that's a no-no, but you can't say nothing. Uh, so you, every time you say a sentence, it has to mean, it has to have value behind it. And so there's, there's always things to talk about and you just have to sort those things out in your brain. So I think analytical is probably my philosophy is look at, look at everything and, and say some things and order those by importance. Ooh. We that was probably that a more one. complex answer than you were looking for. <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's a podcast. We never know what we're looking for. Half the time we can't even figure out what our next question is. So <laughs> it's fine. Um, so so let's let's go into a little bit about grid life first and then one of the things that i don't think people are fully cognizant of is what it takes to live stream an event because these these aren't you know small pieces of land with a couple roads that go left and right these are these are complicated geographically topography wise and uh um signal availability wise so so could we kind of go into that just a little bit yeah and i'm grateful i'm going to preface this with i'm very grateful that i don't have to actually do any of the planning of the technical side so much from a a setting up the broadcast i know very much what goes into it Um, and i think people don't necessarily understand that this isn't like a basketball court where you can have two cameras that are 500 feet away from each other and you've got an internet router 20 feet away as you mentioned you're in the middle of nowhere most times (laughs) where uh, internet is is hard to come by you've got line of sight for anything wireless if there's a a line of trees if there's a boulder if there's elevation change uh, those can all impact any kind of wireless technologies and then you have uh, the equivalent challenge of big events lots of people cell phone interference other wi-fi networks so it really reduces the ability to use wireless tech so every camera i'm not gonna say every 90 percent of the cameras that grid life the stream team uses, which is specialty field, which is run by Matt Johnston, who is an absolute legend. He has a big hand in the, um, the Jim Kana videos that you've seen on YouTube, but 90% of the cameras are wired with glass fiber cable from camera to camera and come back to a 50 foot trailer that is loaded with computers and servers and racks of systems for audio and video. And that all has to be laid out by a team of 12 to 15 people before every event. They're in there before any competitors are, and they're they're there after everyone else leaves. And it takes that entire team a day and a half, sometimes two days to set this up entirely. And from experience, it is all the way up until the minute we hit go live that we're setting up. Um, wow. Or I, it, it is every every minute is critical. And that's because, you know, good life, we're not running the track for a week. We're running the track Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So the stream team could get in Thursday afternoon at, at the earliest. So we're really, really thrashing. SRO, they'll run the track for an entire week. Stream team shows up on Monday. They have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to get things set up. So the scale of it is pretty intense. And then behind all that, the graphics and the, the software that interprets all the timing data and how that's displayed, there's a whole other rabbit hole, <laughs> but wow. it's, it's incredibly complex. And I'm really, really grateful that I work with people a lot smarter than me that handle all the hard stuff. It's, so, so when you guys are doing it, I, I you're constantly because of to a smaller Look. degree, Take we, a breath. <laughs> we have the same, I know it's hard, but to a smaller degree, we have the same problem when you're hosting a podcast. Cause I'm not only thinking about the question, I'm thinking about what your answers. I'm thinking about, you know, all kinds of other stuff. 
Do you have to, or are you involved with the selection of which shots are being shown, or do you kind of get what you get and work off the monitor, or do you work off what you see out of the booth, or I can so, just imagine so, the plate spinning that's going on. Yeah, so so, so that's actually an interesting uh, topic because it was an adjustment I had to make coming from the esports world, where the way I set up Sim TV it was I was announcing and I was also with it's what they call switching when you're selecting the camera shots. And in a, a sim racing environment, I can see anything I want at any time. And I'm the only person preventing myself from seeing that. And it forces you to be very attentive to both what you're saying and what you want to be looking at and what you're currently looking at. On the grid life side, uh, I don't do any of the switching. I'm in a tent that is outside of the trailer, sitting next to Greg. And I have a monitor in front of me and all it's showing me is what you guys at home are seeing. So at, at any time that there's something happening, I have to react to that in the same moment that you do. The difference is I also have producers in my ear that are communicating with me and telling me that there's something happening that I can't see, um, which oftentimes uh, if we're looking at a, a shot of someone on the backstretch and then there's someone hitting pit lane that we need to talk about, they'll let me know that. It's just because maybe the, the guy on track is more important. Um, and also in uh, safety situations, like uh, when there's an accident, I'm immediately texting Adam Jabay. I'm, I'm texting John Raymond. I want to know the updates on drivers. So I'm getting all that information, Slack, uh, email, sometimes text. So there's a lot of information coming from a lot of places, but all I have to go off of visually is what I see in my monitor. I can't even see outside most times. So I'm, I'm in a tent. What I got is what I got. Hmm. That's a lot of plates. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, yeah. so, so some of the shots that I know you're not, uh, utilizing fiber would be your 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 drone guys because that would just be a, a, a god awful mess and i just you know those guys are, are spectacular i don't know if it's the same people all the time those guys and girls don't know but some of the shots they get and, and especially at some of the tracks you don't have full coverage so they're kind of your only coverage of certain areas of the track the distance away that they are is just i don't know how you guys do it the, the drone stuff is incredible. And Matt, who again runs Specialty Field, which is the, the group that we use for streaming, he was kind of the guy to start building drones Went back when this hobby kind of turned into something in the mid 2000s. He was the guy, the first guy building them. So he, mm -hmm. all of his rigs are very, very custom. Uh, he flies them sometimes. There's some other crew members that kind of rotate in and out. Uh, they have an FPV pilot that does all the loops and flips and things that you see uh, for drifting. And sometimes they fly through the trees and it, it really is incredible. And I think we utilize drones better than pretty much anybody else. And it is a, a, a unique perspective that while cool, I've tried to see if we could push away from having to rely on it. As you mentioned, some tracks, Road America, for example, is so expansive that there's almost no choice at the budget level we're operating at. Um, but we've, in the last year, I think we've gotten really good at using the drone for what it's good at and not necessarily as a Band-Aid for lack of coverage. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. One of the things I, I noticed you guys added a little bit to the telecast, I'm calling, calling it a telecast, I don't know if that's the right word, but I'm going with telecast because you'll be on TV soon, yeah. was you had somebody who was helping out like in the pit lane and in the paddock. And I, and I thought that was really helpful because like you say, you're not really, especially with your schedule, you don't seem to get to be able to go to the bathroom. So <laughs> um, you're not really on the ground as much as you probably would like to, just because you can't, you know, split yourself in half and have your other body go walk around and interview people. But I, I thought that was a really great addition and was able to add to what you guys were able to do and, and maybe allow you to breathe a little bit and get your voice back. Yeah, I, I was kind of jealous, actually, of, of the folks that got to pit report this year, because I really enjoy that side of it as well. I've gotten to do that a couple of times, but it was a, a budgetary thing in the past and a technical solve as well. For the reasons I mentioned before, uh, line of sight and interference at the festival events. So there was a, a, a custom rig that Matt built so that the, the roamer cam is what we call that, that allows the someone with a camera on their shoulder to walk away from the, the trailer and not be physically connected by a fiber umbilical cord, basically. Um, and, and so this year we, we had Matt DeRuz come out at Autobahn and give that a shot and he did a fantastic job. And then uh, through FCP Euro, we found Cerise Taylor who came in starting at Alpine Horizon and she absolutely crushed it. Uh, she was fantastic. She had never even heard of any of the names in GLTC until about 10 minutes before the race started. And she you could made, not tell by her pronunciation. 
it was it was some she did a great job and, she and great. honestly she had a, a, a you know a, a really unique style and really casual that really fit the grid life vibe and i hope we have her back next year if not her it'll be somebody else but it's something that we plan on on still doing as next year rolls in so how long have you done this now uh, I started announcing sim racing in 2018. Real racing uh, 2019 was my first go. I got hired uh, just about two years ago in November. So I've only been with Grid Life since fall of 2020 officially. Okay. okay. So, so in the time that you've done that between the iRacing and all the way up till now, do you have any good stories about when things kind of got a little bit wacky? Captain's Log Supplemental. So, Miss Vicky. Yes, sir. Do you remember when we were watching those WRL events and some of those grid life events where you used to see the in-car video and it had like the, the cameras seeing front and back, but it also could see all the telemetry and everything that was going on? Mm-hmm. You know, most of the ones that we liked were taken by the Sentinel system. Remember James came on our podcast earlier? Right. You know, we have no excuse since he uh, lent us one for trial and demonstration purposes. We should actually probably put that in one of our cars, maybe two. I really think we should. I think we should. I know. Because then we'd look like the uh, immature endurance racing team that we are. Oh, wait, I mispronounced that, didn't I? Sorry, my bad. <laughs> we could so what have, does the Sentinel system do? We could have three cameras with picture in picture. We could have, if we ever get the AIM system to work open invitation to anybody from AIM to come on and give us a little bit of love. We need some help. Um, and then we could have all our telemetry on there and then we can have it streamed live into the paddock or around the world to our millions of fans. We're apparently very popular in Kenya right now. Don't know why, but that's fine. <laughs> and it can integrate all the uh, available race statistics from like race here and everything. So we could actually see how we're doing on video. We wouldn't even have to carry around our phone anymore. Live. Um, I love it. Oh, man. Uh, there, there's wacky all the time. Uh, <laughs> I guess, how, how much time do we have? So, <laughs> got a lot, of, a lot of tape in this recorder. Don't <laughs> <laughs> so, Grid Life, um, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of times that things have gone south. I think uh, last year, the spring kickoff event, uh, we had the, the entire Tri County area around Gingerman Raceway had a power outage in the middle of our live stream. So oh, all, se- all seven people, Oh no, <laughs> all seven people. And uh, <laughs> it, so it, it killed the stream, it killed our internet um, and it killed our timing system. And we didn't know, uh, but we all we knew w- was that we weren't, we weren't able to get the stream. We didn't know what the problem was. We just knew that the stream wasn't going out and we didn't have timing. So I had to announce a race with a, a stand in uh, reporter because we were down an announcer um, that had never announced grid life before without timing and scoring information. Um, and without half of our cameras. So that was oh, a real no. challenge um, because you're looking, I mean, it was mostly drone coverage. So we were looking at ants and we had no idea of who was anywhere and we had to really pay attention to kind of keep up with it. So that was a, a, probably the best grid life example. And then, uh, <laughs> on the, again, a lot of it's technical stuff. SRO side at Nashville, one of those, the two uh, GT races I was calling. Again, we're in a, you know, a, like a mobile office with just a screen and uh, Ryan Marine, who's, who was the, the lead announcer, all of a sudden motioned to me that uh, the producers had told him that they couldn't hear him. So I was the only one announcing my first time ever on TV. Here oh, I am no. now carrying oh, no. the weight of this broadcast, oh, um, no. <laughs> not knowing what was going on. And we were doing these hand signals and I, this is my first time working with him. It ended up being okay. The, the viewers noticed and they, they were very critical of the production, but they were not critical of our response to it, which was very satisfying because I was sweating. It was, it was so, so stressful. I, I mean, it, it kind of, it almost put a damper on the weekend if the whole thing wasn't so cool to begin with. Oh no. So, but you managed to pull it out. Yes. It, it was okay in the end. And the, the next race went totally fine. And uh, it, it still stands as one of my favorite days of my motorsports career. So when you look back on any highlights so far, what do you think of and look back on, very fondly, maybe heartwarming. Uh, I, I think anytime you talk about grid life as a whole, it's the community involved in it, right? I, I, the grid life's a small company. There's six full-time employees. And then at the racetrack, you're 
you're dealing with so many people, but it all feels so small as a community. And so the people I've met, the friendships, I don't really have friends in my normal life. I don't necessarily uh, go home and, and hang out with people. My people are racetrack people. And so between events, especially the winners, those can be pretty tough because I don't really have a big social circle outside of my racing friends. So that, that's, that's probably one of those things. And in terms they're of all specific, online, they're all online. Uh, yeah, it's true, but it's not, it's not the same, but it's, it's better to see them and give them a hug in person. But, and then in terms of an event, I think um, for people that were there, I think most people recognize that our circuit legends event at Lime Rock was yep. probably the most special feeling motorsports event I've ever been a part of. It was absolutely phenomenal from every perspective. And I cannot wait uh, to go back to Lime Rock, which is one of the things that we are doing. I know we can't talk about schedule stuff just yet, but uh, Adam, Lime Rock just, Adam already said we're going. Okay, so. great. We're good. Sweet. Cool. <laughs> he, did, he didn't give a date, but it doesn't matter. We'll That's right. It's, it's, it's okay. Lime Rock is amazing. And uh, it's one of my favorite places on earth. And that was such a fantastic event. Had you been there before? I had never been. And it's, it's strange because it's not that far from my, my uh, home in Rochester. It was only about four or five hours away. Yeah. Um, but cool place. It's I just the... I love it where it's on the hill where you can look down and see at least a good portion of the track all the way around or sections of the track um, from almost like bleacher stands way up high. Yeah. You just throw a blanket down. <laughs> well, that was that was why I liked it so much. My parents came, uh, which my, it was my first grid life event my dad has ever gone to. And uh, we had the Jumbotron on the hillside there and the broadcast is on the track side PA. And there just there wasn't a better way to experience a grid life event. That mm -hmm. shady hillside, concessions behind you, mm -hmm. Jumbotron and racetrack in front of you. It's just such a great way. <laughs> it's the it's the weirdest track I've ever been to as a not a not as a track, but as you're driving to it, you're just like. I made a wrong turn. There is no way there's yeah. a racetrack around here. Yeah. There's yep. just no way. I, we missed it. The GPS is flaky. Something's wrong here. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. boom, you're there. And it's like, okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how, how do you manage to keep track of all the different cars and drivers? Uh, I think you, you have to force yourself. Uh, and not necessarily from, it, it, there's, there's kind of two aspects to this. One, it's just a repetition game. You do it more, you're just going to, be in you're going to know more people and the, the first weekend i ever did i really only had to focus on you know seven or eight cars uh, that were kind of on camera most of the time so that that was easy but we have 60 car fields and mm -hmm. if you are not very familiar with with people it's going to be a challenge but it, it gets easier you know you especially now that i kind of also do the entry list for the events so mm -hmm. as those get released i'm in control of that so if there's a new driver i'll take note of what that vehicle make and model is i'll take a note of the number and then i'll take a note of their name and hopefully i can track them down in the paddock before the weekend starts and kind of lock that in and the biggest thing that helps and i tell all new drivers this or drivers that uh don't get a lot of broadcast coverage is come find me if i don't find you and let's just have a conversation because mm -hmm. i will immediately lock you into my brain that way i mm -hmm. really struggle to even i struggle to remember people that i've never had a, a physical interaction with uh, mm -hmm. or, or never at least texted or spoken to. So that's the biggest thing is just that it, it really does help lock a person in your brain, especially if they're standing next to the car. Okay, that silver BMW is this guy, the black Ford is that guy. And then you just, you put those in your brain and then they never really ever leave, which is great. Um, but I, I had trouble with that on the SRO side with fields a third the size, uh, just because I didn't get that face-to-face -face interaction. Right, right. So mm -hmm. one of the things we we do with the podcast is we, we try and always give back to anybody who's ever been a guest. And, and I've come up with the best thing ever as a gift for you. Okay. Vicki and I will be doing Sunday cup next year. And what we are going to give to you during Sunday cup, you will not have to announce our names at all, unless you're talking about who's fighting for DFL. That is where we will be, and, and we will be taking that. So you can just ignore the mini and ignore the red fit which could be any color, who knows what's going on. And you, that's our gift to you. You don't have two more people. You can just cross those two entries off and call it's it good. It's great. I want to know all the Sunday Cup people. That's one of my favorite classes. Uh -huh. I hear it's a cute class. <laughs> it, it's, it's a great class. I mean, it's, it's just, there was that whole, uh, you know, is Sunday Cup real time attack? And there was a whole internet fight about it. And I'm like, you know what? I, I Like I said before, I watch racing. I love racing, all racing. I don't care if you're racing 
uh, lawnmowers or golf carts. It, it, it is, if you can put it on a racetrack uh, or not on a racetrack, if you can put it on a dirt road, a closed course and race them, I want to watch it. I want to see it. I want to talk about it. Um, so whether or not the cars are fast has never really been a bearing, at least for me. And uh, Sunday Cup in particular, the vibe of that class. Everyone wants to have fun. Everyone wants to hang out. Uh, that That's the, the best, most pure part of motorsport for me. So, so tell us a little bit more about the vibe just in general. Are they just like the fun, like the fun little, like yuckety up kind of group? They don't take themselves too seriously, but just enough to be serious. <laughs> I, I love that group because Sunday cup is one of the f- most fierce in terms of its competition, but it doesn't come at the detriment of everyone's relationships with each other because there are people are there for different reasons. Some people are so competitive that uh, they spent $100,000 on an unlimited time attack car and burn themselves out. And they, they still want to compete, but they don't want the financial investment. So they run Sunday Cup. And then there's people that, like me, that are new to driving and new to racing and just want a, a, a reasonably uh, approachable class from a, a financial perspective. So you have these, these two ends of people that are just getting in and people that are intensely competitive. And somehow, I don't know what it is, but everyone just gets along because the competition is close, but you're not in a wheel to wheel context. There's no way to really get mad at each other. Um, Mm -hmm. There's no fighting about, um, you know, this rule or exploiting of that rule because there's not that many rules in Sunday cup because there's not that much you can do. It it just works out. And and Mm -hmm. there's a magic formula there that I think uh, grid life has found. (laughs) Exactly. So is there any truth to the rumor that future podcast guest, he just doesn't know it yet. Future podcast guest, uh, they're going to change the name from Sunday Cup to the Matt Williams Invitational. Yes, that is uh, that's fact um, okay. for sure. All right. uh, maybe it'll be the Kyle Hire Invitational at maybe. some point. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> no, just, I, I don't. I don't know. I, I Matt is he's. I think that car is actually the winningest car in all of Grid Life competition as far as the volume of wins that he has, which hmm. is pretty impressive. So it is, it is, especially after the year that Tomo had last year. Yeah. Just one year. Wow. I think in, in one year, he, Tom racked up more wins than anybody else had previously in a total, year in, in yeah. GL, it, total across all the previous seasons, which yeah. is another very impressive driver. Yeah. We were, we were picking on Adam last when he came on and I was saying, whatever your scoring system is, where Tamo could have not been the champion for the season, whatever your system is, it's wrong. Because <laughs> going into the last event, there is no way he shouldn't have been leading that series with nobody catching it. But yep. Adam does as usual. He listens to me and then ignores me. But that's fine. I, 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 here's a, a fact I'm not sure a lot of people know, but I actually lived with Tom in Chicago for a year. Wow. Um, when he So before he moved up to Wisconsin, where he is now with ASM, uh, he kind of stopped in, in Chicago for a year. And, and so he's, he's very on the road all the time. So I, mm-hmm. he wasn't really around a lot, but uh, he wanted to, to kind of, after the, losing the IMSA ride, he wanted to kind of uh, jump ship, try something different. And I was kind of with him for the entirety of 2021 and that, that up and down season he had there. So uh, he's a really competitive person. And I, I saw every side of Tom, but he's still an awesome, awesome friend. And, and he's done some incredible things. Is there any truth to the internet rumor that he makes all his roommates wear blue sunglasses? Uh, I, so I actually, so this is, this is funny because so FCP Euro had these like sunglasses that they just had like in a bucket one day and everyone grabbed a whole bunch. They had blue, white, and black. And I couldn't find, I grabbed a whole bunch of them, but I could only find the blue ones that I had. And I actually asked Tom, I was like, am I allowed to wear these? Because these look a lot like your sunglasses. And he's like, oh, you're, you're totally fine. They're not even the right color. And I compared him. He's right. His sunglasses are a very special shade that, uh, that seemed to be pretty hard to replicate. But I was I was conscious of that before I wore the blue sunglasses around the paddock. Mm-hmm. We had him on our podcast. And when he just popped on, you know, we were already lined up here. Every, my sister was up here, too. And uh, we all had sunglasses on as soon as he popped on. All the blue sunglasses. <laughs> yep, that sounds about right. We had it all planned, and then we got on the podcast, and we're all wearing the sunglasses, and we realized that they were uh, polarized, and we, could, <laughs> and we couldn't see our screens, so we had to take them off for the rest of the podcast. Yeah, but it's fine. That was, Amazing. That was, it's fine. So I have these internal questions that bang around in my head, and I was wondering, what's how is it different? when you're trying to 
host an event and it's a time attack event versus like a GLTC or a wheel to wheel event? Yeah, so there's there's some big differences there, and I'm not I'm not even sure that I've completely, you know, really cracked this challenge, right? You haven't mastered um, it by 24. Come on, man! What the hell? <laughs> I, I I don't think I've mastered the wheel to wheel stuff either, but it, it was an easier transition for me because that that's as a motorsports fan, it's a lot easier to watch, and um, a lot easier to watch wheel to wheel racing than it is time attack. It's not something that is, is really televised with the frequency of wheel to wheel. However, timed competition is a whole lot easier to get into as a participant. It's kind of the, the first step before you get into wheel to wheel. Uh, so there's a lot of timed competition and, but just not a lot of well-produced uh, timed competitions. So the, the biggest challenge for me, wheel to wheel is something that uh, I, I kind of picked up all the things I know from watching and listening to other people. Time attack, I didn't really know how this was supposed to go. And I think if you go back and watch uh, Road Atlanta 2019 broadcast when I did time attack there. It was an absolute disaster from my perspective. I'm sure it was fine for everybody else. It was but fine. I, it, it is it is a real challenge um, in a in a grouped format to a know who's going fast, uh, b be able to follow them around a lap, and talk intelligently about cars that are wildly different from each other, without ever having driven a car even remotely close to that, uh, and uh, c um, you have to do that for a long period of time because time attack is, is a long competition by nature. So you have to appear as an expert without actually being one. And that I've gotten myself in trouble a couple of times, but every, everybody does uh, for saying the wrong thing or saying something that's just factually incorrect. And you try to really minimize that. Um, but you, know, you, you take your experiences from, from wheel to wheel and you try to apply the things that you know about car control, the things that you know about different chassis and try to appear like you know something. Uh, and then hopefully you eventually learn those things uh, with experience and time. The, the challenges of producing it have not gotten easier uh, because of the, the format and the, the lack of GPS scoring, which is a, it's a detail I won't dive too much into, but we only get updates on where a car is when they cross the start finish line. And that's all we get. Other groups, they'll have sector times or GPS where you can follow, they call it the dancing ants around the timing screen. We don't have any of that. So if someone runs a record lap, it's over before we even saw it. So th right. those are the challenges that uh, that have kind of forced us to take a look from the competition side of how do we create a format that's a little easier to present and also make it more exciting as a spectator experience. So while we're here, um, Kyle, you're you're the official voice of Grid Life. I hear there's this other Adam, not Jebay, but there's this other Adam who's a, supposed to be the official voice of International Time Attack. And I, I, I want to know if there's there's a, a rivalry in the making. I would say no. Uh, I've worked with, with other Adam <laughs> <laughs> a, a whole bunch of times, uh, and he's great. And I think um, I've I've stolen him more often than not from the paddock where – he wanted to just hang out and we just didn't have another announcer and I've made him come work with me. Mm -hmm. So I love having Adam around. I'm not sure he loves having me around because sometimes I ask him to do work when he just wants to hang out. And I would be mad if someone asked me to do that. So he, he's a saint and does a great job whenever he's needed. Yeah, I was just wondering, I didn't, I didn't want there to be some, some friction there because, nope. you know, I listen to their podcast and uh, eventually they will be on. We just have to invite him and be, they have to be in a weak spot and come on, but that's okay. No friction. Right. No, no friction. All right. I just didn't want to, didn't know if there was some, some internal strife in the grid life <laughs> family. And so, so we talked about what it's like to do a wheel to wheel versus a time attack. And we're eventually going to get to the rolls, but I think it fits more smoothly until my injury. You, there's some potential changes to the time attack format, which may help the audience and maybe even you. Yeah, so the, the time attack format change this uh, for this upcoming season for our championship rounds was something that we had been we've been talking about ever since I've uh, I started working here in 2020 and it almost happened last year, um, but uh, the, basically the, the problem with time attack from a spectator and broadcast perspective is the ones I've already mentioned where you don't know when someone's going fast um, and the, the other challenge is the way the competition is formatted, a guy can show up on Friday and go fast in one session 
and then win right there. You don't know that until the end of the weekend, but, but that one lap could be it. So there's no real buildup. There's no tension or, or even no urgency to show uh, the lap that you might not know is already the one that wins. So mm -hmm. the, the, the goal with the new format is to basically force drivers to perform at a particular moment. Um, and, and the way that you do that is with a shootout style format. Uh, and so you see this in, in World Time Attack and other places where uh, the car that is, that is going out for the lap gets the entire track to themselves and they have to go out there and do their lap. They have to attack the time for that particular moment. And that's what, that's what sets the, their weekend results. The challenge is, is we don't have 20 cars to deal with. We have hundred, sometimes 120. So we kind of had to whittle down the field to get to this, this shootout formula, which involves uh, basically a couple practices to let people shake down, get some track time. And then we move into a qualifying stage where uh, we'll essentially select five drivers from each class to perform in this shootout. And then in the shootout, each driver will get two laps uh, and then their fastest lap stands. And then that's how we set our podium. And then obviously fourth and fifth are in that session as well. The, the other big change there is the qualifyings will be done by class because one of the, the other challenges with time attack right now is all the classes are always mixed. So it's hard to get context of who's actually performing well when classes are split between four different groups and uh, there's, you know, three club TR competitors in group A and, and four of them in group B, that now they're all gonna be on track together. You know who's the fastest in club TR. So I was listening to the Slip Angle podcast. Can I drop more podcast references during this one episode? But anyway, I was listening to the podcast and they were talking about the, the new rules and they mentioned that you, you know somebody could win a time attack class on a, on a Friday morning and, and break the car and, and nobody would ever see it or fewer people would see it. And they, they were trying to see um, how they could do that and how it could be more entertaining and also how it could be more, uh, more multiple, you know, in multiple days and, and reward um, or liability. So I think I made Adam's head explode when I wrote him and said, Hey, why don't you make it instead of the fastest lap? Why don't you make it the fastest four laps or five laps? Could be the average, could be the total time, doesn't really matter. And, you know, take whatever, however many sessions you have, divide it by two. And let's say you have eight sessions. So you have four laps, or if you have 10 sessions, you have five laps. And Adam, um, I, I think it took him a few days for his head to, to come back and be able to type, but I, I don't think he was a fan of my, my suggestion. Uh, I, it's interesting. I mean, it's almost like uh, it makes me think of Indy 500 qualifying with like exactly. a lap average, which is which is a cool idea. Uh, and, and I think uh, for another perspective on kind of why we ended up going going this route was um, it kind of a, a staged competition, right? Mm -hmm. There's with the set practices, there's there's a time to test and tune. There's a time where uh, you have to perform, but only to a certain level. And then there's a time where you're it's all on the line. Oh, yeah. And uh, that this way. Uh, it's not perfect. There's certainly issues with it as there is with any format. Um, you know, you, you've, you've got a, a moment at three o'clock on Sunday where everyone can tune in and know that the winner is going to be crowned in this particular moment. Uh, one of the, the fair criticisms has said, well, you know, in the past, if I run a fast lap on Friday and my car breaks, now I lose. And, and that's certainly probably an issue uh, for, for, you know, folks that were used to the old format, but I looked at it as, um, if your car breaks in, in most competitions, you probably won't win it. Uh, the previous format could be one with one lap. Right. This new format requires only two. It just requires you to do well in qualifying and well in the shootout. The only difference is that it has to happen at a particular moment. Uh, so it, it's going to change the feel of the weekend. I think for the drivers, it'll be more exciting. I think for the fans, it will be um, the biggest other challenge is getting track time roughly equivalent with what we had. So the value is still there for competitors, right. but uh, it's stuff we'll sort out in time. And I'm, I'm sure drivers will have feedback and we'll adjust it to match. Yeah. There's a, there's a little bit of feedback online. I don't know if you're involved with the, uh, the back and forth, but it's, it's often <laughs> it's, enter, it's entertaining. I'll go with entertaining since I'm not the recipient of the uh, feedback, shall we say. Um it's so, so in general, um, for the grid life, has there been 
I know you have a new format, but has there been new rules that have been implemented? Yeah, so there's new class rules across all of our time attack competition classes, as well as for Grid Life Touring Cup. And I, so I don't really have a, a lot of say in any particular rules. Uh, I did have a really heavy hand in the new time attack format, that is true. But on the, the, the technical rules standpoint, I don't have a lot of pull there. I, I can offer my opinion to Adam and, and the rest of the, of the team to kind of make those changes or what I think would be good. But it's probably a good thing that I don't actually have the ability to make rules, uh, mostly because A, I'm 24. I haven't been around that long. Uh, the people that are writing them are much smarter, much wiser than I am. And, and B, I also don't race. So I'm not competitively driven. Uh, I don't have the experience behind the wheel to really know the, you know, what a change will do. So I, I trust and I, I feel very confident in guys like Adam and Abe to, to make those decisions. Um, there, are, there have been times when I've said, ah, I, I don't know that that's the right way to do something, but it, it doesn't come from the, the, the driving and car technical standpoint as it does from, I, I've seen this situation on a broadcast or a race or a time attack session. And I feel like that change is gonna do something different than what, it's, what it intends. So we, we've, we've done that. We've, you know, it's a collaborative process. I just, I don't have a, a huge impact on those things. But in terms of the, the technical details, uh, street class got some minor changes. Um, one of the changes was no more standalone ECUs, which people will, will argue about. I don't know enough about it. So that's one of the things that I will say, I, I trust our team. Sunday Cup got some changes uh, that essentially now accounts for the height of a vehicle because drag is a really big deal in, in a class with cars that are, uh, pretty slow. And then GLTC got a, a pretty substantial rewrite in terms of clarifying and removing subjectability in the way that we were handling engine stuff in particular, as well as adding rewards weight for qualifying. So there, there's there's more than that. Track mod got a, an entire rewrite as well. Um, but I think the, the intention of the classes is still pretty much the same. I also don't think that any of the rules changers are going to massively change the balance in any one class. Um, which is kind of a goal, right? You don't necessarily want to tear it up and rewrite it every year. You kind of want to implement tweaks and hopefully get parity a little bit better. And the goal is also to make things a little easier on competitors' wallets too. Sometimes that's not possible because people will spend every penny that they have to be competitive, but you, you try to do your best. So which which ones have gotten the most um, comments? Street class, for sure, uh, <laughs> I think was the one that, because it's a popular class, right? I mean, there's so many people in street class. It's fundamentally been the same for a decade. And what I think my perspective on this, having only been here for a couple of years, is the classes have been the same. The competitors haven't changed that much in terms of who is the, the main players. The cars have been developed a lot, probably way outside the scope of what the rules were. So anytime that you make a retraction to kind of keep the class from outspending itself, it's going to be met with a lot of commentary. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's just a, a sign that, you know, changes have to be made to kind of keep this in the original scope. I mean, our street class cars are often 650 horsepower, all wheel drive monsters. So when you're thinking about the intention of a street class, that might be a little outside of the boundaries of what was originally intended. So that was a loud one. GLTC was pretty loud, I think, from a rules perspective, because I think a lot of people felt like things were pretty good. So there were some changes that looked aggressive. I don't think they actually are. I think they're all going to kind of end up being a net zero. I think uh, for most competitors, I think it will help parity in the mid pack there in GLTC. But there was a lot of people that were kind of hyper focused on new points formats and qualifying stuff and um, it'll all end up being okay. Okay. Well, we, we started this podcast trying to get people either to get started racing or to help them get better at racing. And, you know, hopefully we got better so we could show them that everybody could do it. So let's talk about Kyle's driving. Kyle, oh. <laughs> what are you thinking? You, you, you're going to join the, the craziness. You're going to come into the, the pool and dip your toe a little bit. I think I have to. I think it's it's kind of law at Grid Life. You have to get on track. But the first ever time I showed up to a Grid Life in my 2012 Toyota Corolla, everyone told me to get on the racetrack. So it, it's not from lack of pressure. That's for sure. <laughs> I, I my dream car. This is so silly, but my dream car as when I was in high school was an, a Scion FRS. 
and I went out wow. and bought one. <laughs> so I have one now and I drove that around uh, and I, it's, it's a great street car. It's tuned, set up pretty well for the track. I've driven it on the track a handful of times. I enjoy it, but it's got a payment and it's too pretty. So we're mm -hmm. not going to drive that anymore. So I, no. when I got hired at Gridlife, they gave me what was kind of a hand-me-down 2012 Ford Fiesta hatchback. And I've already put suspension wheels and tires on it. And I intend on running in Sunday Cup next season to uh, to kind of get on track some more and get, as Pete Lindbergh would call it, uh, project seat time. Get my butt in the seat and make myself a better driver. I do want to do some more HPDE, though, and get some coaching because as, as much as I'd like to think I'm not a hazard, you, I, I don't really believe that I've had the reps that I need to be in a, a competition and where I don't hurt anybody else's experience. But how do we how do we get you the time? How do we fit this into a schedule? Because you can't announce oh, sure. while you're yes. going around and around. So. <laughs> well, everyone seems to think that it'd be hilarious for me to announce from inside the car. So maybe we'll get to that point. No, but <laughs> it's 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 not hilarious as as. OK, so short story time. So. Mm -hmm. I recently became an instructor like two years ago. So the first time I had to demonstrate for my student and drive, I went straight off the track because I was talking <laughs> and driving and it's kind of, I guess it's kind of like when you're learning how to play guitar and then you got to sing, you got to do it kind of from the beginning. Cause if you don't do it from the beginning, so no, it, it's two different brains. I mean, no, don't do it. Bad bad day. <laughs> yeah. So what, what really is likely going to happen is next season, We've got championship rounds that are broadcast and we have some, what we're calling club rounds that will not be broadcast. I think it's like a, a six championship and four to five club rounds. I think that's kind of where it settled out. My goal is the first couple club rounds I'm, I'm going to drive. Uh, my, my roles and responsibilities at non-streamed events are essentially just handling driver registration and then being around to lift boxes and do whatever else. So I have the ability to drive at those events. At broadcast rounds, that is not likely to happen this season. I really want to drive at a couple of the new tracks that are on the schedule, which you'll hear about later, but I'm, I'm very excited for that. It, I think the other thing I wanted to do is my Fiesta. I'm going to put a SIM TV livery on, nice. kind of come full circle. Nice. And then I'm going to give it to whoever I, I want in the Sunday cup community to at least get it on the broadcast <laughs> because mm -hmm. I think that'd be cool. Well, if, if you want distance between the car and the field, you can give it to Vicky or I, and we'll be way behind everybody. <laughs> we'll put the cameras on it either way, I bet. So what league are you on in your iRacing? Uh, many. Uh, I, so I don't actually, here's the other thing is I don't drive in real life a whole lot because I'm announcing, and the same is true in sim racing. I used to sim race a lot, and I don't sim race that much. I am on iRacing five days a week. I have a broadcast coming up this evening also, uh, but I haven't driven in iRacing in about six months. So <laughs> to give you an idea of, of the, the offset of driving versus announcing, and it, it, the same is true in, the, in the, the sim racing world. I like sim racing. I enjoy it. It's a fun hobby. I like announcing and sim racing more. Uh, so it, this is, again, why I, I don't have uh, my finger on the pulse of too many of the rules changes, because I'm thinking of it from a different perspective. Um, but yeah, uh, I racing, I'm, I'm in the DC region, SCCA league, grid life's league. Uh, I have some stock car NASCAR buddies that, uh, I am in a couple leagues with the SRO series has a league. Uh, it goes on and on and on. I'm, I'm looking at my discord channel with all the little bubbles stacked up the side <laughs> and it's, it's about a dozen of them, I'd say. Well, Kyle, you remind me of an old saying that I am about to butcher because I'm sure I'm going to mess it up. It's like the, the shoemaker's family doesn't have any shoes. You do all this yeah. announcing, but you never get to race. We need to, we need to at least get a little bit of balance, a little bit of balance. I, I think it's, it is important for me to, to put some more effort behind getting behind the wheel because uh, as an announcer, I think you're better off having experience behind the wheel. Tom is a fantastic announcer. He is. And and he's done a great job. He's, he's worked at the runoffs a handful of times. I don't think you necessarily need... He worked with need... you at uh, Mid-Ohio, I think, was the first mm -hmm. time I ever saw him. Yep, I, I've worked with him a handful of times, and, and he's fantastic. He actually worked for SimTV for a year when he lived with me. Nice. Um, but, you know, I don't think it's, it's a strict requirement to participate in, in a sport that you're announcing. I just think it helps a lot. Sure. Um, and on, on the NASCAR side, um, you know, I look at a guy like Mike Joy, mm -hmm. raced a few times in the 80s, you know, some club level stuff, hasn't really raced a lot since, 
but he is one of the most knowledgeable people on the sport. So uh, there's other driver or other, other announcers that have a ton of experience. Calvin Fish on the SRO side, uh, you know, raced uh, against Ayrton Senna coming up through the ranks in, in Europe and uh, now is announced and announcing in SRO in America and for IMSA and just does a phenomenal job. So for me, I, I'd like to be more of the Calvin Fish type. I, I'd like to get behind the wheel, but it's, it's something that uh, financially is also a challenge. Obviously sure. I'm sure you guys know. So uh, yeah, a little bit. we'll get there. So if we were to, if we were to make a, uh, a suggestion for you, if we were to, if we were to give you a prescription for what, what you should drive, you should, if your first time, I would say maybe a gingerman event, cause there's almost nothing you can do wrong at gingerman that turns out badly. Mm-hmm. And then to challenge yourself, you need to get out there one time with you driving and one time with Tom driving, get out there on a wet mid Ohio, just to, to see what it feels like from your perspective and then to see what like somebody like Tom can do in the wet, especially at mid Ohio. I have a confession to make. My first time ever driving on a racetrack was in 2020 at road America mm-hmm. in the rain in a car that was not mine. <laughs> so awesome. I, my first ever experience driving on track was, uh, was Ben Harisco's uh, Mazda Miata. His it basically it was a spec Miata that was running in GLTC. And he allowed me to borrow that car for the weekend and do our beginner program in that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I've gotten some experience at road America, Gingerman and Black Hawk farms. Mm-hmm. and uh love driving at gingerman because i don't feel like i'm gonna crash it's nope. great nope um, there's nothing blackhawk there. farms that was really dumb it was the first time i ever drove my frs on track was at that place you can hit stuff at blackhawk farms there's there's stuff um so that was dumb but it was fun and then <laughs> which is how racing goes most of the time and then road america i need to get back there because that was the sim racing experience really really helped there mm-hmm. and i had never heel toed downshifted a car until i went into turn five on my warm-up lap and Ooh. the first time I went to do it, it was all muscle memory from the sim and it worked. And I was like, this is, this is how this actually happens. <laughs> and then I, I mean, obviously it was like a little clunky for the first couple laps, but sure. uh, I, DJ Alessandrini will tell you the same thing. Sim racing is, is extremely important if you can know what to get out of it. And I mm-hmm. think for me, I did, and, and it helped a lot. I've also ridden with Tom a whole bunch of times. Um, and let me tell you, that is an experience. Yeah. I can just, uh, Having driven on many tracks in the rain, Mid Ohio is a certain extra slice of hell. I mean, uh, uh, fun <laughs> in the rain. Yeah, I've I've ridden at Mid Ohio in the rain with <laughs> DJ and his Civic on street tires. Nice. And I got a real good idea of how slick Mid Ohio is. <laughs> and we actually I had I laughed about it because we went off into the carousel. Um, you know, in, in full, this is this is wet, like rivers across the racetrack, yep. wet in an HPD session. And I, I, I felt the car sliding, and, and DJ says, "Uh oh." And we're doing 60, 70 miles an hour into the carousel. And I, I thought for a second, go, man, Tom never says, uh oh, when he drives with me in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was a moment, but we, we kept it on the track. Yeah. I remember trying to explain it to Vicki for her first time going to mid Ohio. And she's like, how bad can it be? And then we got there and it was dry for the beginning and then it got wet. And she's like, Oh my God. As bad, oh as, God. As, bad as you think it could be. And then multiply that by time. time yeah. Right yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. 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 Absolutely. Kyle, thank you for coming on. We hope you had a good time. I had a blast. I don't really do a lot of podcasts and I I enjoy, you'd think I would do them as a guy that talks for a living, Mm -hmm. but I I just, it's a, it's fun. I don't really talk about my, myself a whole lot uh, on stuff like this. So it's, it's kind of fun. It was good to hang out with you guys. So if people want to follow along, I know that we're kind of in the off season for the Northern hemisphere, unless you're going to start traveling to Australia and New Zealand, we have listeners down there. We're apparently quite <laughs> popular in Kenya as well, but uh, how would they follow along with you, Kyle? Well, I think uh, easiest way. I think uh, my Instagram is probably my most active social media. Uh, 15 underscore Kyle H is my social media. You can also find Sim TV on Facebook and YouTube. That's kind of where I, I do all my, uh, my streaming stuff. And then as far as the grid life stuff goes, I'll see everybody at the racetrack and you can find me at the, the registration area, uh, typically. Um, but that, that's, uh, you know, or in the announce booth, come knock on the, the I guess the, the door, it's more of a flap, but <laughs> come on in and say hi. The tent wall, whatever. The tent wall, yeah. <laughs> well, sir, it was great to uh, get to catch up with you and get to learn a little bit more about you because we've heard your voice for many, 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 many hours. 
and uh, <laughs> enjoy it thoroughly. Vicky often refers to Grid Life live streaming weekends as a wasted weekend on my part because I don't seem to leave the TV. <laughs> but uh, I always tell her, you know, Vicky, it could be worse. I could be helping you in the garage, and that would make things go slower and worse. So it's it's good. We get more done. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, all I, all I say is, anytime I'm watching motorsports, I'm at work. So if I'm lounging on the couch eating a bag of Cheetos, I'm working. You're scouting. <laughs> I'm trying to see who's who, who I got to take down next. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, sir, it's been great to talk to you and it was always great to listen. And uh, we, I seriously cannot wait for next season. And it's uh, November. I mean, oh, wait, it's December now. So <sighs> patience is not my strong point, but we'll get there. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. 